I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this episode of the podcast. I hope you're all staying safe and well at this time and that you're managing to look after your physical and mental health. This is the first episode I've released this month that hasn't been pre-recorded and scheduled for release in advance as I was trying to get organised and clear my desk for other work but you know what they say about best laid plans. So this is my first mention of the coronavirus and the lockdown and I hope you all have lots of podcasts queued up to keep you company whilst you're stuck indoors. I notice I've had a spike in listener figures so a very big welcome if you're new to the show. Please feel free to subscribe and review the show if you like it, as this helps me keep a toehold in a market where little independent podcasts are becoming more and more squeezed out by the bigger broadcasters. And talking of supporting independent enterprises, for this episode and the rest of April, I've decided to give a mention to the independent retailers and suppliers who are still operating a UK mail order service. And this week, it's my pleasure to let you know that Ashwood Nurseries are still open for mail order business. And right now, they have a fab selection of Primula auriculars and Louisias to provide you with spring colour and, let's face it, some good cheer in the form of flowers when we could all do with some. And these plants are ideal for pots, so you don't need a huge garden to house some. Ashwood Nurseries has a wide range of other plants available too, and their plants are amazing. And if you've never treated yourself to an Ashwood Hellebore, please save your pennies for next year and make sure you get one. You will never regret it. If you'd like to browse through their large range, just go to ashwoodnurseries.com. Thank you to everyone who's supporting local nurseries, and good luck to the team over at Ashwood Nurseries, who are working hard to get through these tough times. So on to the episode. This week I'm speaking to Nicola Mady, who's been making and using natural dyes using the contents of her own and other people's gardens, and over the years, through trial and error, she's gained a huge amount of knowledge that she's happy to share. If you're stuck indoors with little to do, making dyes is a fantastic pastime that you should be able to do using just the contents of your garden or store cupboard. This episode is for anyone looking to learn a new skill or keep children entertained, and it will hopefully give you enough pointers to go off and explore natural dyes for yourself. It's a slightly longer episode than usual, so sit back and, like a scoured piece of fabric, soak up the dye of Nicola's knowledge. Dyeing is a hobby for all ages, as Nikki explains. Uh, Yeah, yeah, I do it with Poppy, who's three. There's some things she can't do, but uh, she loves bits like going and picking all the flower heads with her little pair of plastic scissors. And she says, I'm very good at this. I'm a good gardener. (laughs) And she looks and says... Not sure Grandad would be very pleased. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, I know. I thought that when you sent me the pictures of all the flowers, I was thinking, oh, my God, I'd be heartbroken if someone locked off my dahlias in full flow. uh... Well, you just deadhead them, Sarah. You have to be brave. But if you're you're in the dye trance, you don't care. You just (laughs) go for them. Do they make a different colour if they're sort of going over? Can you still use them? Some plants are better as they're going over or even as they're completely dried up. Um, So buddleias, I've just died with some buddleias which have been sitting in the shed since last summer because you actually wait for the flowers to die before you die with them. But then other flowers, it's probably better to use them when they're fresh. But a lot of a lot of dye stuff is you can dry. And why do they come out a completely different colour a lot of the time to what the... the the flowers are is it a chemical thing I think this is the chemistry which uh, is a bit of a mystery to me a plant scientist would probably have a bit more understanding as to which chemicals do what but I suppose you know they are quite a mystery aren't they flowers you think how beautiful they look in a vase and then as they fade they all go brown and (laughs) smelly and you think, oh dear, yes, that's a, they're not so good dead. But uh, how do they all come out different colours? I don't know. No, it's a funny thing. Is it trial and error or are there books that you can actually, or, or kind of online resources? I know we're going to come to that later, but, it, you know, do, do most dyers kind of go through a trial and error process? I think it's a bit of both. There is a lot of information out there. There's a lot of uh, lists of tried and tested recipes and tried and tested flowers because it's an ancient ancient art form um which we've sort of forgotten a bit so 
Well, like so many things, I suppose. Um, yeah. And do they get? Do you get consistent results? Um, I would say probably they're always probably always a little bit different. Um, it depends how strict you are at weighing and measuring. And I'm I tend to be a bit more haphazard and creative and chuck a bit in. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Kamal. What, Kamal wants to take over the dye process and catalogue and record and weigh. But fortunately, he's too busy planting seeds at the moment to do that. Because to me, it would be a bit of a chore. But um, some people do, I think, do it very exactly. And then you probably can get more consistent results. But for me, I tend to be dying small amounts as a one-off thing. And so I'm not worried about having consistent results. When they talk about using natural dyes instead of synthetic dyes, one of the difficulties is that you do get variation between the dye batches. I mean, flowers are different, aren't they? So I guess that's, you know, part of the Yeah, different times of year because each day they change. And it's like if you buy wool, often you're buying it from a particular dye batch to get that consistency because a different dye batch will have a slightly different tone. Yeah, I think that's the beauty of it, to be honest, the unpredictability. Um, Yeah. So obviously we're talking about dyes and um, particularly natural dyes using plants from your garden. So how easy is it to do? Um, Well, when I sort of first stopped work, I thought, oh, now's the time to do some natural dyeing. Tried to dye a piece of cotton, which came out sort of beigey colour. And I gave up and thought, oh, this is just impossible. (laughs) (laughs) Far too difficult. But then uh, I sort of plodded on and I went on a little dye class, which was just a couple of hours. And that got me sort of started and thinking about it a bit more. So I think what you have to sort of realise is there's two parts. One is making the natural dye from your plants. But the other is preparing the fabric so the dye actually sticks onto the fabric. And how do you prepare the fabric, or does that depend on what fabric it is? It depends on the fabric, but I suppose the basic things are getting the fabric really, really clean, and that's a process called scouring, and tends to involve boiling the fabric or simmering it. If it's silk, you bring it up to just under the boil and hold it there maybe for an hour. Um, to get all the finishes out, all the grease out where people have handled it. Because if you don't do that, you'll get a splotchy dye effect with white spots. Uh, Or or the dye might not take at all. So first of all, you get this fabric really clean and um, wet. So when they talk about dyeing and they say, oh, wet your fabric, that usually involves soaking it overnight. So don't, you don't just run it under the tap. You've got to give it a long soak to really get the moisture into all the fibres. And then you have to do a process called mordanting. And that's where you introduce usually a metallic substance to the cloth. And that binds to the fibres of the cloth. And then the dye actually attaches to that. So the mordanting Um, is quite important. Um, I've been trying to do natural dyeing using things around me. So you can make mordants out of plants. So I've got a box full of oak galls and acorns because they are high in tannin, which also sticks well to the dye, but have also got a mordant in them. Well, that's a good use for all those acorns that you collect up off your driveway. (laughs) Yeah, and you can just dye with the acorns on their own, um, but you can sort of under dye if you like with them, and then do another dye on the top. But the oak galls tend to be a bit lighter in colour, so they don't affect your dye colour quite so much. Um, the, probably the chemicals, sort of metals people use most are um, aluminium, so you can buy alum. Um, which they used to put in jars of pickle to keep them preserved and keep the colour good. So a lot of people use alum, 
um, because it's not a particularly toxic chemical. So if you're dying with children, probably alum is a good dye to you, a good mordant to use if you're going to use a mordant. It depends what you're dyeing the material for. So if I'm making a scarf to sell, I want the dye to stay on there. So alum you can buy from a lot of dye suppliers and they'll just post it to you. Um, alum is good on silk and then on cotton you're better using something called aluminium acetate which is a slightly different composition of a similar thing. Um, so a lot of dye suppliers just post stuff to you because they don't tend to have shops that you can go and buy it in. Well that's handy at the moment. Yep, so that works well. You can find them easily on the internet. If you just Google Natural Dye Supplies UK, up they'll pop. And a lot of them have information on their websites as well about what to use. And they sell starter kits and things like that. So that can be a good way of getting started. Um, The other mordant or the other substance people use, it's not really mordant, um, but to bind the colour to a fabric is soya milk so that's something I think they've probably been using it in some countries for a long time and what you do is you make a diluted bucket of soya milk and water and then you soak your piece of cloth in it for 12 hours squeeze it and hang it up to dry and then you do that twice more and then you leave it for a few days for the fabric to cure and bond with the fibres for Um, and then give it a rinse and it's ready to use. So that's a sort of three-day process, really. And this might sound like a daft question, but do you have to start with a white fabric? Uh, No, you can start with a coloured fabric. People use vintage fabrics quite a lot because they don't have so much finishes and things in them. I tend to always use white because then I can see what the colour is going to be and it's a nice clear colour on it. Um, But if I've dyed something and it's not come out as I want it to, I dye it again with something else. So you can apply layers of dye on top of each other. And if you do that, you don't need to mordant in between because the mordant's already there in the fibre. So again, if you take a colour, it depends what it's been dyed with. I suppose most fabrics now are dyed with... Uh, synthetic dyes so it's a different process so you may still need to mordant it and is it more difficult with the vintage fabrics because obviously you were talking about you know getting the grease out of them and stuff no because they've usually been washed and laundered a lot of the time so uh, often they're pretty clean so you just boil them up rinse them off and then you're ready to start applying some sort of mordant so before the mordant, you can also apply a tannin. So uh, you're probably familiar with tannins, which you find in leaves and... Wine. Wine, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> tea. So tannin sticks to the fibres quite nicely. So some people only use a tannin. So uh, in these days when maybe people aren't wanting to spend money, have delivery men arriving... A tannin that you could use is something like tea or green tea, which is quite pale in colour and has high tannin. So to do that, you just save a few tea bags. You can drink your tea first or sacrifice some tea bags to the dye project. Uh, Throw maybe half a dozen in a big saucepan, fill it with water, slowly heat it, get your very clean scoured fabric drop it in and let it sit in there for an hour simmering and then take it out, squeeze it off, dry it off and the tannin should have stuck to the fibres. So some of the things I've been doing this week, I've purposely not used any other mordant other than tea because that's something that people can get out their cupboard and use very easily. And does that colour the fabric in itself? It does colour the fabric. So whatever mordant you use makes a difference to what happens with your end result. And that's true across all mordants. Again, people like alum because it's quite clear 
uh, doesn't interfere with the colour too much. So that's why that gets used quite a lot. And if you mix a little bit of cream of tartar with the alum, it brightens the colours. I think most of the things I sent you a picture of have been mordanted in tea. Oh, right. Okay. That's really interesting. Or not mordant. I shouldn't call it mordant because some dye person will say, that's not a mordant. (laughs) So if people are looking on the internet for information, um, there is quite a lot of misinformation, of course, on the internet. And in the sort of dye circles and chat groups, people get really frustrated when you call the thing a wrong thing. (laughs) Don't get your terminology wrong. Yeah, don't get your terminology wrong. There's a lot of sort of heated discussions about it. (laughs) And there's also discussions about things like salt. So when I was looking up where could people find information, I found someone um, talking about salt. And a lot of people will say salt doesn't fix a natural dye to a fabric. But this person clearly felt it did. Um, and was recommending using salt. So, again, uh, I don't know, but generally I would say salt is now considered not to be a good way of fixing the dye to the fabric. Because one of the, I suppose we're all thinking about things being sustainable. Mm-hmm. So you can use a natural dye. You can accept, well, it might fade, it might wash out. It's only for me, I'll re-dye it. But if you want something that's going to last for a long time, uh, you want it to fix on well, to stay on the f- fibre and maybe not change too much. Yeah. And and can you use any fabric? Um, natural dyes like natural fabric. So generally you've got protein fabrics, which means they've come from animals. So you've got wool, mohair, angora, silk, uh, wool felt. And then you've got something called cellulose fabrics, which have come from plants. So you've got cotton, bamboo, linen, muslin, and rayon. So that's where you use your alum on the protein fibres and the aluminium acetate on the cellulose fibres. And there's also a lot of people use um, a sort of chalk with the the cellulose fibres after the aluminium acetate. Uh, the supplier I buy from doesn't seem to sell that. So I've just, I've not done a, I mostly dye with silk. So I'm just starting on the cotton. So I'm trying it just with aluminium acetate, but it may be that I, I'm going to have to find some chalk from somewhere to add in. But it seems to be dying okay. So I'll see what happens with it, really. Mm, I imagine there are people that have got chalk in their gardens or around. So. <laughs> yeah, they might have. Yeah. Um, the silk, I, I use silk a lot. It sounds sort of exotic, but it's actually, you can buy silk for dyeing quite cheaply. Um, it takes up the colour really quickly. And just because silk is so glossy and sort of shiny, it always looks nice, even if it's very pale. Whereas if you dye a piece of cotton, and I've got some in front of me here, which I've done this week. So I've got I've been dyeing with um, stinging nettles this week. So I've got a piece of silk dyed with sting nettles which looks pale green and glossy and then I've got a a slightly murky green piece of cotton (laughs) which is quite nice it's got a sort of slight marble look where the dye is not exactly even but if you think of sort of pieces of marble you've got this sort of lining across it in darker areas which actually looks quite nice but you lose the sort of shimmery, shiny effect that you get with silk. Yeah, it does look lovely from the pictures that you've sent. It, the silk is really stunning. Yeah. So so when I'm making scarves, you know, people always love the silk just on its own, really, because it's such a nice material. So it's easy to work with. Whereas the cotton, you've got to be a bit more careful, I think, really, with your trying to get it to stick on there nicely. This could be another daft question, but do you buy them ready, kind of made as scarves, or is it that something you do with them afterwards? Do you kind of hem them and stuff? You can do both. So uh, I do have some which I've bought ready hemmed, um, really because 
it takes a long time to hem around a meter and a half long scarf. So that might take two or three hours to do. <laughs> yeah. So you sort of got to think, I suppose, of yourself. What are you going, if, if you dye the material, what are you, what are you going to do with it? Do you want to make something with it? Or do you have a friend that sews that could whiz up a cushion for you? So I've tended to do these scarves because they're easy. People just want them when they see them. So I don't even have to sort of market them. People just take them away from me. Um, but I've also made cushions, table napkins. You could do bags, aprons, add bits onto clothes, pockets, all sorts of things, really. If you make lots of little samples, you can patchwork them all together. Because one of the things, especially if you're dying with children, um, a good thing to do might be what they call solar dyeing, where you stuff your plant material into a jar with some salt and water, stuff a bit of material into the jar, and then stand it on a sunny windowsill for a couple of weeks. Poke it every day, and then at the end of it, take out your material. So I've got a, I had some red cabbage, which we were eating. But on the outside, usually there's a few leaves that you really don't want to eat, especially if it's sat in the fridge for a while. So I've shredded up the outer leaves, put them into a kilner jar with some salt. Um, I put the salt in because these dye pots tend to go mouldy. So if you use salt, they sort of ferment and it keeps them fresh. And the salt does help draw out the juice then I filled it up with water and within about three days I've got this lovely purple dye which is from the red cabbage. Uh, Red cabbage is not a good dye because it's not very light fast it's not very wash fast it tends to fade and change but it's great for trying to understand how dyes work so with that I just stuffed inside it a piece of material which I'd put in the tea tannin. And I've taken it out and cut it into four squares. So when it came out, it was purpley colour. But with, especially with, with all dyes, the pH of the water and, you, and what you do after you've dyed it can affect the colour of the dye. So if you do a red cabbage pot, leave it for two or three days, take out the piece of material, cut it up, Then have two dishes, and in one dish I've got lemon juice, and in the other dish I've got uh, bicarbonate of soda and a little bit of water with the bicarbonate of soda, which again, most people have it for cake making, use baking powder, or you could use household ammonia if you've got that. It smells disgusting though, so (laughs) I'd rather use something like bicarb of soda. And then take a square and put one in each of these little dishes. And what will happen is they'll change colour in front of your eyes. So I've now got a pink square and a greeny blue square. And then I had two other squares. And, of course, you're tending to sort of drip drip bits of material. So I've just splattered some of each of those on the other two squares. Um so that I've got some splotchy squares. So they're quite nicely patterned now with these sort of pink and greeny splotches. So I'm just leaving all of those to dry. While those were doing, I've got a pot of lichen dye. Now, lichen is a strange thing. Um, It's supposed to be a good dye. You don't need to mordant your material or any of that faff. So it sounds like a bit of a gift. But my experience has been that the lichen that I can get most easily just drops off the oak trees around me in little sort of fluffy pieces. And you have to soak it for about six to eight weeks in a mixture of ammonia and water. So you put uh, about half and half. Stir it every day. Smells absolutely disgusting. But I had a piece of fabric that had been sitting in this dye for about 24 hours. And when I'd looked at it, it was still pretty colourless. But what I've noticed with a lichen dye 
is if you stick the piece of material that's been in the lichen dye in another dye, it takes up the dye really quickly. So I've taken that piece of fabric, stuffed it in the cabbage pot this morning, taken it out this afternoon. So as well as this blue, pink and this this pink piece and this greeny blue piece, I've also got quite a nice sort of pinky, purpley piece. So I'm just letting that dry really to see what colour it ends up. So I when you put it in much... sorry, when you put it in the lemon juice or the bicarb, um is that yeah. like a fixative? Is that what that's doing? No, that's called a modifier. Oh god, so, so... technical. <laughs> so after you've after you've put your dye onto the material, to extend the range of colours you can modify the dye. So a modifier is a substance that um changes the colour and it either changes it by changing the pH or also iron is a very good modifier. So you don't have to use those then they're just if you want no, to. No you don't have to it. but the the um the splotchy pieces I put one in in some water that has had iron sitting in it so it's like rusty water because iron helps is a mordant as well. So the iron helps fix the colour. So on this red cabbage dye, which is very unreliable, um, I've just put this in some iron water to see how that affects the colour and whether it keeps the colour there a little bit longer. And then I've got another jar which has got copper water in it. So that's got a couple of bits of copper pipe soaking in water and that gives me copper, which is also a mordant. So you can either use the iron and the copper to put on either straight onto the cotton or the silk or on top of a tannin to help hold the colour. But you can also use them after you've dyed as a modifier. So they sort of darken the colour and may, may help hold it a bit longer. But so we'll see. But for children... Um, the red cabbage is good because you've got something that is a nice, zany, bright colour. Um, often children aren't too bothered about it still looking the same colour in a month's time because they're probably <laughs> doing something else by then. Um, and they've learnt, you know, how to get a dye out of a plant, how to put the material in. They might have thought what they might do with it. Uh, they might have sewn it up into something. On, on them really. Children are creative and usually they might have chopped it all up and made it into a collage. Um, so that's quite a nice, nice thing to try. The other pots I've had on the go for about two weeks, I've had bay leaves in a jar of water and in with the bay leaves I stuck three of my oak galls to act as a mordant and then chuck the same bit of silk, same bit of cotton in and they've come out quite nicely. But you can sort of see the leaves on them, which is nice. So you can see where the leaf, the leaves have sat in the jar. And then they've made a sort of paler leaf pattern within the dye. So those are quite nice. Uh, I've had some dried buddleia flowers uh, sitting in the pot. And they had some salt in the pot and a little bit of copper solution. I've taken those out and then I've uh, cut it. Oh, there were three pieces in that pot. So one I've dipped in iron and that's gone a sort of grey. One I've dipped in more copper. So that's been a slightly darker beige yellow. And one is just a sort of quite a light beige. Often the bad if you heat them, will dye a very nice yellow. But these have just been mm. sitting on a sunny windowsill. And are you always using the pot to sort of steep the fabric in the dye? Is that the accepted method or are there different methods? For the solar dyeing, I'm just putting the plant material, maybe some sort of mordant or not, and the fabric and some salt and letting it sit on the windowsill for a couple of weeks. Um, some people build rather complicated sort of foil-lined um, containers to really get the dye hot. But for this experiment, they're just sitting on the windowsill. But usually with a dye, um, what you would want to do 
is to take your material. So, so we've got the. Let's imagine we've got the fabric all ready to go. So the next step is making the dye bath. So you take your material, which might be flowers, petals, leaves, bark, nuts, walnut shells. So they'll all need a slightly different um, treatment, but the, probably the quickest dye to do is with a flower. Now, some flowers don't hold colour very well, but at the moment we've still got quite a lot of daffodils around. So one, one dye that people could try is a daffodil dye. So you have to pick your daffodils just maybe as they're about to go over, if you can't bear to pick them when they're in full flower. <laughs> so pick your daffodils, chop them all up with a pair of scissors, pour some hot water over them and let them soak for a day or two. You can soak them in any thing like a plastic ice cream tub, um, for your dyeing, use something that you don't use in your kitchen to cook and eat with because who knows what's in a daffodil. It could be something that's a bit poisonous. So chop it all up. Let it sit in that to soak for a little bit. Again, I tend to add a little bit of salt just to stop it going too mouldy. Um, then after a couple of days... Tip all of that. Now, here you'll have to sacrifice a saucepan because you need something to heat it in. So if you've got an old saucepan that's quite big that you don't mind not using for food anymore, you can tip it all into the saucepan and then just heat it very gently. If you heat it too fast, you run the risk of it going brown. So just heat it up gently and then... When it's at a, just under a simmer, pop your material in and it should turn yellow. I've done two silk scarves this year like this and they came out, one came out very, very bright yellow, took up a lot of the dye. And then because it was quite a strong dye pot, I did another scarf that came out a pale yellow. Oh, OK. So it's actually take, it is diluting the dye every time you put a different piece of It'll fabric It'll dilute in. it because when you put your fabric into the dye bath, the dye will come out of the water onto your fabric. So it'll soak up the colour. And then the next thing that you put in there will be paler. You can also um, find that the colour of the dye bath might change depending on what's in the fabric that you put in. So if you've used, say I've uh, used alum on a piece of fabric, put it in the dye pot. Some of the alum may seep into the water a little bit and slightly change the colour of the dye. If I then put a piece of fabric in that's either been dyed with another dye or has been in iron, it'll change the colour of that dye. So iron tends to what they call sadden the dye, which means it makes it go a bit of a darker, more muted colour. So love that. So yeah, no, they can be beautiful, um, and again, it depends what you like really. Um, but it will change the whole dye pot. It's a bit like dropping a bit of ink into a glass of water; the whole glass changes colour. <laughs> so, yeah. so everything you do to your dye pot, whether it's putting something in, taking something out, will change the colour of the entire pot. Hmm. So that's just something you have to sort of bear in mind when you're trying things out um so one th one thing i sometimes do is if i've made say i've made a beautiful yellow daffodil dye and then i think oh i've got this other scarf that looks a bit old and rubbishy uh, perhaps i'll chuck it in there is try to remember to have two pots that you're sacrificing for your dyeing and to to split the dye in two so that if if it doesn't work or it goes all gray um, I've still got my original dye to fall back on if I want to. Mm. Yeah, that's a good tip. Again, with the iron, you can make your iron water by putting some rusty nails, bits of old coat hanger, a few safety pins into a jar, put a third vinegar, two-thirds water, 
and just let it go rusty. And that takes about three weeks. Oh, I was going to ask you where you got the iron but from. But if you're a gardener, you might find mm. you've actually got iron in your garden shed. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but when I started yes. doing this, I was thinking, oh, this is a long time to wait for a bit of iron water. I was in the garden shed, which is now my dye shed, and I found some iron. I thought, perfect, I can use this. <laughs> a spoonful of this in a bucket of water. And that's my modifier. I can use it as a mordant. Um, so you might find you've got some things already that you can just pilfer. I mean, living in Sussex as we do, quite often you might you'll go for a, uh, for a walk in the woodlands, and you will find a stream which has got a lot of iron in it. I yes. suppose you could. Well, you could try. Um, different water has different things in it, so. For dyers, rainwater tends to be the best water to use because it doesn't have too much chemical in it, hopefully. So I'm always forever dipping buckets into my water tubs that come off the greenhouse to get the rainwater to dye with. Um, If you use it out of a Sussex stream, it may have iron in already. You, you could, I mean, good luck to Kamal trying to systematise this. He's never going to do it because there's so many variables. <laughs> there are a lot of variables, but it's about trial and error and practice. So right across the world, people have always died for thousands of years and they've used whatever is in their local region. Different dyes will come from different places. Um, I was just thinking, actually, looking out at my garden, I think the things that are going to pop forth at the moment are wallflowers and tulips. Um, is there Are there any flowers you can't use? Well, lots, is, or yes, no, there lots going? you can't use, I'm afraid so. <laughs> oh. Daffodils are good. They have a dye in them. The yellow dyes tend to be the easiest to extract and to catch. Blues and reds are very difficult. So you can take a beautiful red dahlia, and it'll tend to make a yellow dye um, rather than a red dye. And some plants are known to be better for dyeing than others. So the ones I would recommend trying at the moment are Mahonia, Nettles. Again, it's a bit of a tricky dye because it's got a lot of natural minerals and iron in a nettle. So when you pick the nettles, put them in water, you then need to soak them. Heat them, let it cool. Heat them again, let it cool. And gradually this sort of, what you, the liquid you've got will go blacker and blacker. But when you dye with it, it's actually quite pale. And then after you've taken your nettle dyed piece of material out, um, because of the iron, if you leave it in the air for a little while, it'll oxidise a bit. And that again slightly changes the colour. To get a green rather than a yellow, I've added a little bit more iron into my mixture. Uh, Bay leaves are quite a good dye. Um, I've done some rosemary recently because that's all shooting beautifully. So I've snipped off some little bits of the rosemary bushes. Uh, Dandelions. I've got a little pot of dandelion heads, which whenever I see a dandelion flower, I nip and pick it off and shove it in the pot. And I'm waiting really to see what colour that ends up. At the moment, it's a bit of a murky brown. There's definitely colour coming from it, but it is a bit brown looking. Docks. I haven't tried docks. They're on my list of things to try. The dock leaves are all coming. Yeah, so you can snip off and try the dock leaves. Uh, brambles. So, Oh, what, the leaves? Leaves and the prickly twigs. So last year I did a sort of hedgerow mix dye where I used some bramble stems all chopped up, uh, some blackberries chucked in, some hawthorn flowers or berries. Um, Berries, berries, although you'd think they'd be a lovely dye, tend not to be. I know, but but they're what they call a stain. So the colour goes, you know, if you crush a raspberry onto your jumper by mistake, at first it's red and then it goes brown and leaves the stain. So although it does something, it's not really a good dye. Um, then not considered a particularly good dye. People do dye with them, um, 
particularly elderberries and blackberries, that they're a little bit sort of likely to fade and go brown. But the actual bramble wood and the bramble leaves will probably give a better dye. Because interestingly, the brambles are on, uh, in my garden at the moment, they're really deep red yeah. where they're just kind of coming into the ground yeah. they've got this flush. So again, I guess it depends on when you, when you harvest yes, them. Yes, probably. So um, hmm. the ones I did last year tended to be in the autumn. Um, but as you say, at the moment, they look quite reddish. So I'm not sure what they will do. And also wood, bark and wood. I was just about to say that, bark, yeah. So, Is that, what does that, that, does that give you, does that give you brown? <laughs> you have to embrace the brown. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's a birch. Birch, um, yeah, I've just, I have died with birch recently and it's given a lovely pale pink. Oh, wow. It is pale. Oh, it's so interesting. That it's, uh, it's a lovely colour and a nice quality. Because when you dye, something happens in the process of the bonding. So I'm dying on silk a lot. Some of them leave it feeling a bit sort of rough and grainy. But the um, birch uh, wood has left the silk very soft and sort of slithery. So you think, oh, that's a nice stuff because it just feels beautiful. Why does it make it grainy? Is it actually the sort of the particles that are I attached think so. to the fabric? I do don't think? know, but um, I think it is. So last year I dyed two scarves. I dyed um, a pink one with some bought madder root. So madder is a plant. You can use the roots for dyeing. Uh, makes a pinky red. It's been used in India, different places for hundreds of years, and you can buy madder powder. Um, so I bought some madder powder because the other way of getting a pink dye is from avocado stones. But again, it's not a very lasting dye, it tends to go brown. So a lot of the dyers in the world would say, well, you know, it's, it's what they call a fugitive dye, it runs away, don't use it. But for, for comparison, I made a scarf with a madder dye and a scarf with the avocado stone sky. And if you think of avocados, they're quite oily. So when I came to give a friend, I said, I said would you like one of these pink scarves? And she said, oh, yes. And she said, I, so she felt them both. And she said, I like this one. I said, oh, well, no, don't have that one because it's the same colour as this madder one. But I think the colour won't last on it forever. You know, it's going to fade. And she said, I don't care. I want this one because it feels so nice. She said, I can tell that this is, you know. <laughs> so she went off very happily with uh, the avocado scarf. But that was really based on how it felt. Because the one that had been dyed with madder, she felt the material felt a bit coarser. And it was exactly the same material. But it was just the feel of it was different. So, and I suppose, you know, people, I've got friends who just love something that's been dyed with something close to um, maybe where they live or where I live. So it's quite nice to have something that's dyed with things from your garden or things from somebody else's garden. So I do go pilfering around at other people's gardens with their permission. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because you never have all the things you want in your own garden. No, I mean, I'm surprised people don't bring you batches of things to use. I mean, I'm tempted to drop off all Yes, things. well, they, they're very welcome. The other thing with the mordants that I just want to mention is you can make mordants out of, for your, to lock the colour onto your fabric. And we've mentioned oak galls, acorns, staghorn sumac leaves, another mordant. So I'm looking for someone with a staghorn sumac bush that they're going to be pruning. Because... Yeah, you won't find anyone sane with that in their garden, I'm afraid. <laughs> no, we <laughs> haven't got one. But uh, mm. the leaves, a handful of those leaves uh, make a good mordant with water. And rhubarb leaves are the other oh. mordant. Rhubarb leaves. You must have some of those. I've got some rhubarb that's growing at the moment. You can dye with the rhubarb stems. They don't oh. need a mordant. I haven't dyed with them, so I don't know what colour they will get. Um, but you can 
make a mordant with rhubarb leaves. Again, you have to be careful because it's quite poisonous. Uh, it's very high in oxalic acid. So I might try some. I sort of I was put off it last year because of it being so poisonous. But now I'm in isolation. I haven't got a little three-year-old helping me. <laughs> so, so I think I I will be tempted to try the rhubarb leaves. Are there any colours that you can't achieve? Well, historically, there are colours which are difficult. Um, purple has for a long time been connected with royalty because it was such an expensive dye to make. So this is why we know as well that red cabbage isn't going to be a good dye because otherwise someone would have used it. <laughs> we couldn't have the king strutting around in a cabbage. So No, because it would go grey and beige and the colour would wash out and it would be no good. So, um, so the purples are quite difficult to get and to keep. Um, and one of the first dyes that was discovered in the sort of 1800s was a purple movine dye. The chap that was trying to make a chemical form of quinine, while he was doing that, discovered that he had actually made a purple dye. And that was the start of synthetic dyeing. But before that, purple was often um, extracted from shellfish. So you get Phoenician purple. Um, from murex and they sort of get the shellfish and squeeze out this dye from them but it takes a lot of shellfish to dye a little piece of material yeah so that's a hard one so if you if anyone finds them getting a lovely purple dye they're doing well (laughs) red is red is quite difficult um Uh again how about roses are they any good for it um well, I have tried rose petals without a great deal of success. So, again, it's something to try, but I'm not sure. Um, in the ki- in your kitchen, uh, onion skins are quite a good dye. What tends to happen is when you f- dye with onion skins, um, it fades off, but then it stops fading. So it'll fade at first and then hold. And again, it's a nice safe dye to use with children it'll be a sort of brownie orangey okay right I'm going to ask you this is my last question before I ask you about kind of further resources um how about soil soil what dying with Mm. soil Mm. well I haven't done it um but in a lot of countries so in Africa they use mud clay soil dung because they didn't have access to so many plants So it's not something that I have tried. I know people have buried pieces of cloth in compost heaps because there's something in this sort of fermenting process and the heat that you get. Because heat helps the dye to stick. So one of the things you're often looking for, you make your dye, you get your colour, and then you hold the material in it at a heat. And that helps it attach to the fabric. Um, so again, a compost heap has quite a lot of heat in it, but it's not something that I've got much experience with. I think often the um, the clays and um, they're used quite a lot for surface decoration as well of the fabric. Well, I could actually speak to you, I think, for another four hours, but I, as, well, it's I'm a big sure subject. It's do. a huge subject. Yeah. Um, and that's why it's quite a good subject for people to do at this time when they're all stuck at home, because there is a lot of material that you can read on the Internet. <clears throat> Some of the people that run courses in dyeing are doing really good deals on online courses at the moment. Um, so I've signed up for an online course myself, which was about 150 quid cheaper than at any other time. Um, there's books, which obviously people can order and get delivered to them. Um, and a lot of online sort of resources that people have put on the internet. So are we allowed to recommend particular yes. people and yes, things? Yes, please do. The writer that seems to have the most credibility among the stars at the moment is a lady called Jenny Dean. And she's done a book, Make and Use Natural Dyes, Wild Colour. 
and that's got really realistic uh, little sort of graphs down the side of what all the different colours are going to turn out like. And they're really accurate. So um, last year I did some dyeing with Dyer's Broom, or Genista Tinctoria, and my pieces all came out exactly the same as the colours that she told me they would. So that that's a really good book. It's worth looking online at something called The Wild Diary, D-Y-E-R-Y. Um, she's got lots of information and some of these nice courses. There's a website called Maiwa, M-A-I-W-A dot com. Um, I think they're in Canada. But she has a lot of information about dying and how to die on there. There's also one called Deckel Dyes. Again, I don't think they're in England, but Suzanne Deckel um, is, has got a lot of knowledge and has a blog. It's a lot on the internet. And um, I think probably runs one of the Facebook groups on natural dyeing. So for people who are sort of on the internet, on Facebook, there's a lot of groups on Facebook that you can sign up to and exchange ideas, get information um, from people online. So there's a whole, this is why I have these dye pots going, because Suzanne Deckel is doing it as a sort of little project for while people are indoors, and then she wants you to send in photos, and she'll put them in her newsletter. So things like that. So again, it's quite a nice community and a way of keeping in touch with people when you maybe are feeling quite cut off at the moment. So it's worth people having a look online. Um, the other ones I've written down here, traditionaldieworks.com and Sea Salt. Sea Salt Stories, one called Sophie Chadwick. She tells you how to do berry-based dyes, vegetable-based dyes, and I think she's got an area that kids can post their dyeing projects on and share ideas so I think it's quite a user-friendly sort of site um, and good for getting ideas and maybe again having a bit of contact with other people through that. And if you are feeling alone or fed up you can always contact me on podcasts at rootsandall.co.uk. I'm really always pleased to hear from listeners. So before I go don't forget you can still order plants from the brilliant Ashwood Nurseries, ashwoodnurseries.com. I'd like to say a very big thank you to Nicola for taking part in the interview. A huge thanks to you for listening as well. Please stay safe and well and join me again next Tuesday at 8am for another episode. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk. Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.